principle and cosmic purpose remain. Victoriously they establish again and again the fountain of reality and identity. Within the consciousness as they bestow the ever-present grace of God, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit. I come then today to saturate the world again with the flame of pure truth with the flame of pure virtue and the ideas of God that from the beginning have sustained the beneficent cosmic purposes which are the fruit of his mind and heart. Hear ye then, O beloved children of the flame. Hear ye then, O children of God, occupying space upon this planetary body the Lord has descended again and again to the planet as a tiny babe, as a spirit flame, as the fashion of cosmic identity to bear before the world the grandeur of cosmic mission, to bear before the world the sense of fulfillment, of purity of purpose and living ideals. The world has again and again rejected those men of the spirit as the carnal mind in its own surfeiting greed has sought to enclose within the domain of the individual all of the world's goods of gold and of precious stones and of selfish acquisition. But we who understand the fruit of the spirit and the jewels of the spirit and the conveyances that are made by the bequests of the Most High God, firm for you now within your consciousness the reality of the blessed gift of life, for life herself is a treasure, a treasure of opportunity, a treasure of realization, a treasure of overcoming, a passion for the Holy Spirit, and the flame that glows in the myriad colors of the flowers of the world, in the fireflies that glow by day and by night, the fireflies of cosmic love, bursting forth as musical notes into a sundering reality that establishes the differences between mortality and immortality that conveys the messages of love to the hearts of both child and all people upon the planetary body. And now today, as the flame of cosmic purpose is born in its great surging power to the world, I am come to say to the people of Czechoslovakia, where the flame of freedom is so nurtured within the heart, be firm in your convictions for freedom's sake and give not up an inch of ground to the aggressor. For the Lord God that is given to men the air to breathe has established a flame within thy nation and that flame shall bear thee up if thou wouldst only adhere to it. And pray God the world might also, taking example by the small nations, understand the need of summoning, the summoning of the elect, the summoning of cosmic purpose, to wash in the great land of America the clothing of mankind, 
that they may presume now as they see the record shaping up with its dark clouds and twisted misshapen clouds of things to come, realizing and understanding the need to mend their fences, as you say, and correct those outer conditions before it is too late. Oh, beloved one, everywhere there is a need for understanding, and everywhere there is a need for happiness, for happiness is born upon the wings of understanding, and understanding stems from truth, and truth from God. But truth seems to be a willy-nilly thing to some among mankind who presume to snatch it hither and yon from the various intellectual tomes of the world. We say to you that truth is life, and truth is God. The Holy Spirit, then, is he who will guide you into all truth, who will illumine by the fires of himself the darkened recesses of the mind, the rooms that no man then has seen, that are now dwelling in places of darkness, will find themselves illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And the chambers of being will resound with the echoes of cosmic laughter, the laughter of victory, the laughter of immortality, the pressures and powers of security in the hands of Almighty God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And the meaning of that, as not fully explained, exists within the structure of mankind. And as he comes to know himself as a divine reality, he will see that the plans now being fulfilled in the processes of initiation, in the processes of obtaining victory, are themselves mightily assisting men to rise out of carnal thought and its darkened processes into the higher reaches of the continents of the air where the glory and light of the angelic host is a patine of pure gold upon the revealing clouds of heaven, the clouds of witnesses the holy representatives of the spirit divine, the spirit of divine usefulness, the spirit of divine strength, the spirit of divine energy, the spirit of divine mercy and compassion, the spirit of truth and reality. Truth and reality are one, but so often, the obscuring conditions existing in the mind and feelings of men create those awful separation feelings which do not assuage mortal grief or wipe away the tears from the eyes of men but create in their place of blood tide of mortal tears and sorrow. We who come to you then as spiritual overseers, as spiritual fathers, as brethren of light, we come in the name of God to establish here among men, here where the living dust creates and is destroyed, a passion for the things of the spirit and the kingdom that can never be destroyed, that can never end, but will always serve to convey transcendentally to mankind step by step as he climbs to higher octaves of God-realization, the firmness of the joy of that love that ought to ring the personal world around and around and around. Surround yourselves then with swaddling garments of light. Surround yourselves then with feelings of reality that come from your presence. And fear not to touch the feet of those whom you may not outwardly deem worthy. Fear not to wash their feet. 
to, if necessary, wipe them with your hair. For out of humility is born a sense of God reality. And men who discover God in others will discover him within their own thoughts. Benediction will be given by Saint Germain. O oh, thou wondrous flame that has imparted again and again to the souls of men the breath of thy recurrent loveliness, bring now into the mind of these who choose thee a realization of freedom as the gift of immortality. Awaken within them those subterranean stirrings that will become the head of action and manifestation. Let them see now in the egg of creation the wonders of the spirit conveying new hopes and sundering veils until the flame of reality is open clear to the eyes that behold that which I am.
the soft petals of God's love surround the fabric of the mind and the fragrance is ensouled by the beauty of the divine heart. We bring you greetings from Shambhala and the spirit of the Prince of Peace. Ours is awareness of his mission, of the eternal vigil for the earth, for the heart of the enlightened ones, solemnly gathers together in that holy conclave that bestowing budding divinity upon a child gives to him the mantle flame of a future regeneration. The hand of God is the hand of peace, and the hand of his peace provides celestial security to terrestrial natives who long to behold our abode. Shambhala and the marble bridge. Shambhala, mystic city of fair radiance. Shambhala, queen of the cities of the earth. In our hearts dwells that cool flame of peace, that cool white flame of peace, that soft flower radiance that bestows the caress of God upon the Beloved, and who is not the Beloved? Each pebble, each grain of sand, or celestial orb, he loveth all. He giveth to all the fruit of striving, the wisdom flame, and the tenderness of his care. My brethren, assembled now from our sister star, Venus, hail to thee, Sanat Kumara, Rex, Lord of the world, Rex, Lord of creation. Hail to thee, Sanat Kumara, Thou Regent Father, Beloved and most precious Lanto and Confucius, the great cosmic emissaries from starry bands and from the great central sun magnet. We raise up and exalt once again the memory of the Prince of Peace and the blessed Babe of the New Year, the little pure one who comes to man without spot and blemish, the fair and blessed textured parchment upon which is to be written the fate of mankind. We are aware of the world of form and the world of the formless. We are aware of the dark shadows and the dispelling magnificence of the sun. 
we are aware of the charity that begins at home here upon this so-called dark star the charity that requires the banding together of hearts that the shoring up of the world may be done that the flood tides of destructivity be assuaged, that the mercies of God be amplified. Our prayer in the name of the great white brotherhood is for peace. Our prayer in the name of the great white brotherhood is for enlightenment. Our prayer in the name of the great white brotherhood is for abundance. Our prayer in the name of the Great White Brotherhood is for the fruit of understanding to be scattered to the family of nations. And as we assemble here, O brethren of light, it is mindful also of the blessedness of Wisak. It is mindful also of the gathering of souls into that beautiful valley and of the harvest of Christ's accomplishment. The centuries to us seem as but beads of a rosary and our fingers caress the accomplishments made in the name of humanity. But the end is not now, nor will it be, for the permanence of striving is assured for the cosmic lords know full well they know full well that among mankind there are hearts that were like our own hearts determined to complete the mission they came to do hearts that will not say give up Hearts that will pray, Lord, give us the cup and let us drink and walk in thy footsteps. Because it is so, my brethren, because the Prince of Peace has drawn very nigh unto you throughout this conference, and because the hosts of heaven support your earliest endeavors to produce world action on behalf of the youth, and the staying of the hand of doom, we are determined to present our own petition to the karmic board this night, sealed in living letters of light. And this petition is for an activity of what is known as half a time. And this half a time means that we have asked point of equipoise to be created where on January 18th the lords of karma would agree and consent to take this half a time and permit it to be a function most discretionary whereby it could go either way either the path of the dark cycle or the beginning of a point of light that mankind have never known before. I feel that this petition will be granted, and if it is done, it will not mean that the cycle was averted, but that it has what you would call a 50-50 chance of being averted. This does not mean that the students should become overly confident. It means that mankind have one more year in which, if they are careful, they may stay the hand of karmic law and have this year what would amount to a final opportunity to mend their fences, to prepare their defenses, to make a turn from materialism to the pathway of peace. It could go either way, blessed ones. It simply means that now, in a half a time, it has an opportunity 
and that means an extension on 2 July and the Royal Teton Conference then. But the half a time could be misused, and so it could come to pass that before July should come, the fires of mankind's aversion to peace would break out in horrible destructivity. Or the elements themselves could erupt in such a display of cosmic anguish as to make the heart almost to stop. Because this is so, and because there is that danger as well as that opportunity for deliverance, we want the students to take the fullest advantage of that offer which we have petitioned so solemnly and which we have had some prior assurance can well be granted this night. And now, as your petitions have been received, together with our own, drawn forth by the hand of the angels, and gathered together from our various outposts upon the planetary body, we shall patiently wait the moment when the lords of karma shall say our deliberations are finished. The hour is near when we shall receive the descending images of this blessed, blessed year. The chalice descends and in it is the thought form for the year. It is the Ark of the Covenant. It is simple. It was formed long ago. And now we see it in its preserved and beauteous state, inlaid with gold and having upon its top the covering cherubim. We see the light of the Ark of the Covenant in all of its blazing brilliance, the Shekinah glory. And this ancient symbol of Israel and of the promise speaks to men of their rights to make a covenant with God and to know that this Divine One will also place the tablets of the law within the ark of their heart. Is it not written, I will write my laws in your hearts and minds. In your hearts and minds will I write them, saith the Lord. Let no one be disappointed at this thought form for the Lord that have delivered it unto us have great faith that although it is a symbol old, it is a symbol of particular meaning for this year of peril. For do not men now more than ever need to make a covenant with God? And if that covenant be with your own beloved I am present, is it not then sealed in the wholeness of truth and the faith that you bear in your heart? Does it not relate to the identity of each one of you? Does it not bring you joy to know that in your heart this thought form can itself lodge and bring you peace? You can feel in the hidden recesses of your heart within the presence of this ark, an ark of safety, an ark of light, a place to receive the commandments of God, that they themselves, being written there, may speak out from your heart with the authority of the law from Zion. For did I not correctly apprehend him? 
when he said, Zion is my holy mount, and I will dwell therein forever. Shall not the joy of Zion then run throughout the earth and the great four rivers themselves in their confluence comment upon the restoration of the consciousness of Eden? Can Eden then be restored to man, a paradise lost? As John Milton wrote, can it not now be a paradise regained? Did we ourselves not experience it before we made our ascension when the attunement of the angelic hosts came to us and we were able to grasp those wondrous principles of universal love that are often expressed to us here in Shambhala by the beloved God Himalaya? Again and again, in the retreat of the Blue Lotus, the God Himalaya silently speaks to those of us who are able to understand His message. And we are always thrilled at how He takes the grandiose concepts of cosmos and reduces them to those childlike pictures of the purity of love and then conveys them to us without scarcely a smile. We think there are times when we have noted a twinkle in his eye. But even those of us skillful in discerning the quickest motions that can be made even by ascended beings are sometimes not sure. For he seems so completely enamored with the divine that even at inner levels he scarcely stops his meditations upon love long enough to even convey to us what you would consider an accurate thought. But then the very height and depth and reality of his meditations are themselves the source of infinite inspiration to the ascended host. It is interesting how that in the panoply of ascended masters some have decided that they will, as Babaji and Mataji, manifest certain qualities of proximity to the celestial light where there is no escape therefrom. They seem to have little desire to actually hold consort with the children of men being completely devotees of the Most High. Then again there are others like your blessed Saint Francis who is sometimes almost tardy at the courts of heaven for he is so busy serving the needs of mankind. It is almost excessively interesting to us to observe the character differences in the ascended masters and how they have actually preserved some of the little foibles that you would consider to be human traits that are really not. For some of the traits that mankind hold today as almost repugnant to one another when they are raised and elevated by the divine light, become facets of service of great value. We are not trying to tell you tonight not to change your ways. We are simply telling you when you come to ponder the character of one another that many times little things that may seem to trouble you in your own sense of propriety are not nearly so bad when they are refined by the fires of heaven. Take, for example, the quality of boldness. Sometimes the meek who shall inherit the earth are not just exactly taken up with the idea of another's boldness. Yet, we are fully aware that this boldness, when raised to higher levels, has won worlds and has assisted mightily in the preservation of cardinal principles which are so meaningful to the people of this earth. Will you understand then that tonight we have given you a most simple ceremony in the lowering of the thought form? We have given you most simple instruction, yet profound because of the outreach of our love towards your hearts individually and collectively. 
but ours is really a passion for peace. And we are aware of the awful criticisms leveled at those nations embroiled today in armed conflict. But we want you to understand that whereas war is gross involving many people, we are just as concerned for a family feud or a little difference between brothers or brother and sister. We are concerned everywhere for the advent of peace, in the homes, in the schools, in the churches, in the world, in the marts of commerce, in the kingdoms of nature, as well as the kingdoms of men. We are concerned with attunement with the angels, that the instruction for the assimilation of true art be conveyed to children, that the divine sense which some of you have developed in your listening to music or ministering unto men may be amplified, that you may understand that ours is to unite both East and West, to spread the balm of pure love and to garner the world prayer sense and offer it to the feet of God. Ours is also to gather the balms of nature, the balms of the spirit, the ungans of healing, and apply them to tired minds to hearts that beat slowly because of the weight of oppression, to those who are fearful and lack courage, to those who tremble, to those who are so sure that they are right, that they have already made preparation for their attainment to the extent of almost literally informing the world by invitation to attend their coronation or ascension. We want all segments of humanity to understand that the heavenly ones continue to actually convey enlightenment to them. And the media of conveyance are not always the same. For in actuality, we would not like to bore you in any way with our service. Yet we are fully aware that without it, Thousands of years might elapse where you would make but little progress. For we know in our own case that it was the ascended ones above us prior to our ascension who drew us to them and who gave us the support of their love, their grace, and their wisdom. Truly to be a Buddha, to be a budding one, finally enlightened, where the fires of the mind opening in these soft petals of cosmic love are able to manifest as a thousand petaled lotus of light. The fires of the brain as the Shakti rises from the spinal base up unto the very top of the head are actually such an inspiration to the angelic host for it signifies to them that a soul is about to be born again into the kingdom of light. That a star, a nova, is about to suddenly appear in the firmament of that one's mind. That the mantle of cosmic attainment will soon be dropped upon another pair of shoulders. And the Herculean task of guiding the world will be assumed by one more life who will share the burdens that heaven shares in their concern for the children of the world. And yet the economy which we are dictated to by Alpha and Omega, by Helios and Vesta, must be observed. We are reminded again and again not to waste our energy, not to give our energy unnecessarily to those who are not willing to follow the mandates of cosmic law or to those who dwell in the temples and halls of their own conceit. We are asked again and again to withhold our light from them, for if we give it unto them, they have always misqualified it and made it corollary to their own ego. And for this reason, it has come to pass that many who would be magnificent candidates for greater illumination 
have been denied it because of these human qualities. And many who were simple cobblers or tillers of the soil or men relatively ignorant by human standards have had conveyed upon them the fruit of cosmic illumination because they dwelled in a temple of love and humility. Let all then learn from the examples of these and understand that the Lord draweth nigh to those who are humble. He giveth them grace, but he resisteth the proud. These old statements must always be remembered. For in a subtle moment of human pride, the enemy comes forth, and he wrecks his havoc upon the individual. How tender, then, is my desire now to enfold you one and all, in the mantle flame of my peace. And so I have asked 10,000 of the angels of all the Buddhas that have ever lived upon this planet to converge upon this city, Colorado Springs. And I have asked that here, from your focus, they shall first come and then depart carrying to the four corners of the world ribbons of light, streamers of peace, and streamers of hope. We have even been graced, mind you, with beloved faith, with beloved hope, and with beloved charity. And they have formed a triangle directly above your focus at La Tourelle. They are in the air, 333 feet above this building and this beautiful triangle shall remain for nine days glowing with the love of faith, hope and charity extending its power into 1969 and precious ones of the light the 10,000 angels of peace that have come with me tonight shall lower upon your heads now the feeling of of God peace. Is that not sweet? Is that not tender? Is that not an example of the passion of the coolness of grace and brotherhood, the coolness that cools the fires of human passions of anger and of irritation. There is even a rustling in the atmosphere as they move about. They are lovers of your cosmic identity. And now that the blessing has been bestowed, we say, charge these angels with your love. Raise your hands upward and charge them with your love. Now as they receive your love, we say, angels of peace from Gautama's heart, depart. Go to the four corners of the world and carry our love and with it the love of these blessed ones, that the world may share all over the world the mantle of Christ's peace. You may lower your arms now, for they have gone several seconds, winging on their way and carrying the advent of their blessing to mankind. When I have finished speaking, I wish you to sing joy to the world, and I promise you that the joy that you feel then will permeate the earth. This is my simple message, my simple love, my simple purity, which I give to you and to the world, that they may learn that in the humble manifestations of God, the true spirit of brotherhood sweeps the world, and thus, as you look forward expectantly into 1969, 
it shall be toward a year of Christ's victory, toward a year of the Queen of Light's manifestation of the Mother of the World, and to the amplification and extension of cosmic wisdom and the wisdom of peace to humanity. You may then call throughout this year for wisdom and sanity and balance to appear in the hearts of the leaders of the world. And this is what is needed. For many of the people themselves long for peace, but their leaders push them toward the brink of destructivity. In the name of faith, in the name of hope, and in the name of charity, I salute you with the kiss of Christ's peace. Salute him. God is beautiful. As we close now this magnificent conference of Ascended Master Friends of Light, we wish to ask your attention as we ask the blessing of God upon this world. O almighty and infinite Father of lights, thou who hast created the diadem shining hearts of light that ought to manifest in everyone, we ask that everyone tonight will receive a special blessing from far off worlds into the world that sometimes seems so lonely and separate from cosmos. Let everyone that feels the prison house of the flesh or the enclosure of mortality around them feel the vibratory action of the universal Christ exercising his passion for healing love upon this earth. And come thou, Lord, to earth again this year, 1969, to teach the children of men how to involve themselves in a service to all, to one another, that the world may grow in grace and the fruit of their endeavors may be magnified as they take dominion over the world in thy name and spread the sweet fruit of brotherhood from pole to pole and carry even into space to orbs that move through space, the love of this world that is thy own. We thank thee for the Christ, for the Buddha, for every mother's love, for every parent's love, for every father's love, for brother and sister's love, for husband and wife's love, and for children and parents' love, for the love of rulers and kings and adepts of the spirit, for the angelic host and the elemental beings that serve this earth so well, for the beings of fire, earth, water, and air, and to thy supreme and sweet heart of light, we ask that we may be blessed now and may carry that blessing everywhere, that the whole earth be literally drenched with the golden sunlight of thy love and the mantle flame of far-off stars, that all the world now will know the wonder of thy love. So should it be, both now and for all eternity, that this moment in time may be sealed in the archives of eternity, that all who have attended this class may find their names written in those archives, because the service they begin from this day forward will never cease, and the light they hold will never go out. We thank thee. Amen. Charity and faith and hope abide with us always and the power to invoke the memory of the words he spoke. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. In the name of life and light and love from the great central sun, the chorus of the angels helps to make us all one because they sing a song of unity and the Ark of the Covenant is within our heart.
And we are now those children of all that is real, passing across the barren deserts of self and heading for the promised land. flame angels, hail cosmic beings of transmutation, hail children of the one God. The hour has come and now is when the valiant flame of transmutation must be perceived as the panacea for every doubt and fear. Individuals should understand that the power of the archangels is here when you invoke it when you believe in it, when you trust in God and understand that it is his electronic flame essence which is descending in response to your call. Beloved ones, you are the children of the Son. You are the children of the One. You are supremely blessed to have the understanding in the correct use of the violet transmuting flame. If the world today were able to accept the violet transmuting flame, most of the problems today that are troubling mankind would literally melt away. For individuals again and again are infecting one another with their own discord and inharmony. 
They are listening to the dark ones and to the negative fears that are created in their own mind and which give rise to a host of negative opinions concerning many matters and prevent them from the full acceptance and pressure of that magnificent God faith which always gives to each individual the great calmness, the great calmness of knowing that his divine presence is always bestowing upon him grace from on high in answer to his call. Won't you understand that the cosmic law is the fullness of divine love to everyone? Won't you understand the justice of that law, the justice that bestows upon both just and unjust, the self-same bands, I said bands of opportunity that link mankind to his own cosmic reality. What difference does it make what mortal opinions may say? Don't you know, blessed ones, already from the tests that you have experimented with concerning this law, and I speak to those who do, don't you know that these conditions have given you a relative sense of freedom? Well, precious ones, if you have received a relative sense of freedom, does it not show you that you can go on and on and accept more and more of the pressure of the light until you have the fullness of everything that you want or that your heart would desire of divine grace and those ordinances which are for the perfectionment of mankind? It does not matter because individuals from time to time seem to fall short of the mark if they will only understand and accept it and not allow their feelings to be disturbed by it, that we are able to assist you here below in gradually melting away those human problems which so dreadfully torment you at times. It is simply a matter, then, of the pressure of acceptance in your world of that which your divine God Self has already known, which your presence holds secure for you, which you in your best moments hold secure for yourself. And if you will only understand that, there will be no need for struggle, but only a need for the acceptance of the light that is able to enter in with the fullness of its great bestowing divinity right into the world where you are and see to it by a divine decree that you are given everything you so well deserve. Now some individuals with tongue in cheek may say, well, I'm not so sure that I deserve the best things. Perish that thought, beloved ones. It does not matter what densities may have occupied your mind in the past or what inequities you yourselves may have allowed to function through your world. The moment that you begin to accept the love of God, there is given to you an opportunity to walk in that love if you will not admit the outer pressures of human thought and feeling to have entrance to your world. You can always pay off those debts by cosmic grace and do it from a moment of triumph rather than try to do it from a moment of struggle. If you will understand this, if you will permit your feelings to become calm and in that calm knowing establish your contact with those of us who are of the archangelic host, you will find that our light is like a mighty sea of cosmic energy flowing through the force field of your human identity. And sometimes you may surprise us, and then again we may surprise you, and sometimes you may surprise yourself at how quickly you can dissipate momentous clouds or seemingly momentous clouds of dark substance that seems to terrify you with the very thought that you might not succeed in effecting the cure or whatever it is that you want over conditions that are not just as you want them. If you will only understand that this is a natural, beautiful outpicturing of cosmic law, that it is a transcendent manifestation of universal grace, it will help you ever so much to calm your feeling world. There is never a need to struggle for calmness, for when individuals begin to struggle for it, they produce just the opposite. And therefore, the thing that you ought to let enter your consciousness today is that it is a matter of accepting what God has already bestowed. And when you accept something, precious ones, the hands that give it to you, give it to you with love. 
and therefore your hands should receive it with love. Transmutative effort is really a marvelous thing to behold from inner levels. For an individual here below is sitting there all surrounded with all manner of thoughts of negation, just the contrary to divine grace, and all around the individual, the mighty power of light, like giant electrodes of cosmic energy, is forming. And the angels stand there with palms outstretched, and there comes across the force field of the human an arc of cosmic light energy. And as that arc flashes forth, it seems to literally vaporize the negative conditions and they literally disappear from heart and mind. Well, precious ones, if you maintain the harmony of your feeling worlds that comes to you at that moment and just determine that nothing was ever going to interfere with it, it would give a mighty pressure of acceptance to the whole matter. For then, you see, we would be able to assist you in the maintaining of it. But when you turn toward outer sources and you turn toward outer conversations, sometimes these conversations are actually held in your own mind, you know, and you yourselves are talking to yourself and saying, well, I just wonder if I will be able to hold this in my feeling world. I wonder whether or not I will let go of it as I did once before. The moment you say that, you are already opening the door to lose it, don't you see? And the whole matter is one of individuals recognizing and understanding that the compassion of God must be established. It is a natural estate, you know. And when you understand that and the pressure of that natural estate descends, well, then it's altogether different, you see. Please understand that I am not speaking to chasten you. I am speaking because I love you. And every ascended master speaks because he loves you, even when it may seem to you that it has some idea of chastening in it. For there is a very specific momentum, a precious momentum of cosmic effort on the heart and part of every ascended master in his releases to you, not only through this conference, but through all of the various dictations which we cause to be ushered forth for your benefit. Some of the students do not understand why we speak so often. They seem to feel that perhaps it is because we are always giving them new instruction. And then others say, we have heard this before. It does not matter whether you have heard it before or how many times you have heard it. It does not matter what you think about a dictation. What is important is that during the time of the dictation, your attention is placed upon us and upon higher things. And during those moments, we are able to let flow over into your world the transmutative efforts which you seek. Won't you understand this? Won't you accept the grace of it and recognize that God in all of his tremendous love for you has provided these things as avenues of service into your world? It is true that in the outer world where ordinary Religious activities are being pursued. There is an entirely different activity than what you find here. It is also true that here is a place where you find what they might consider to be strange practices. And they probably would and do feel that these activities are not activities of light because they are so conditioned to accept the idea of only God and Christ and a few of the specific biblical characters whom they have come to know as being the only ones who exist in the tenements of heaven. Let me say to you that such, of course, is not the case. And we who understand it, if we did not ourselves have a sense of spiritual balance, would often be overawed by what you call so simply the hosts of heaven. Why the hosts of heaven, blessed ones, are in such astronomical proportions. There are so many of them that if we, for example, were ourselves to think of the numberless ones, and I prefer to use that term, I assure you that we ourselves would sit back in awe because of the tremendous number of cosmic light beings and angelic hosts and elementals that exist in the cosmos. But it is not necessary for individuals to think of all the people in the world in order to be happy with their family. And therefore, there are circles within circles. And this activity is a circle of great light. Sometimes it may seem small, and other times it may seem large. But whether large or small, the important factor is that the work is being done, that humanity is being served here, that St. Germain and the various ascended masters are finding a forum where they can express the great God power and the magnificent truths of all the ages with great freedom. Do you realize what it means to have the freedom for progressive revelation? 
Do you realize what it means not to have the limitations of dogma set upon the mouths of the heavenly hosts? We are able to teach as we wish, and we can draw to ourselves those students who are ready for those specific momentums of service which we have to give. And that way, the various ones here upon this planetary body who are seeking so much for their ascension and for their freedom will find it that much easier. I am sure that you do understand what I am saying, and I feel now some comfort in the knowledge that my words are not going out into a void to return empty-handed unto God. They are going out in order to perform those great transmutative efforts which the cosmic hierarchy so long to see in effect. They are going out into the world of form to cleanse the world of its impurities, to create a great stream of transmutations, light rays throughout the planetary body, dissolving those dark cesspools of malignance and destruction which are mankind's present intent to frame, and preparing a way, a highway of light, where the tremendous powers of the cosmic hierarchies and ascended hosts can raise the consciousness of the mankind of this earth into those dimensions which they once knew with such tremendous love and gratitude. Once again, then, let us restore the boundaries of the old temple. Let us make known the passions of the divine for the human, and let all understand that the human must become the divine. With this idea in mind, with the fruit of acceptance in your feeling worlds, let nothing, no nothing of outer conditions dissuade you from the course. I do not care what conditions may seem to confront you if you will only recognize that God is the ruler and that he rules in you that the potential that he has in the universe is also the potential in your own world. It will mightily assist you to the acceptance of the power of transmutation's flame. And when that flame blazes in its fullness upon the altar of your being, I tell you, it has the power to sweep away those dark clouds of human nonsense that you have accumulated without desire. And even those you have accumulated with desire, and both will go the same way, into the domain of cosmic grace, into the great violet fire cauldrons where they are no more. And bubbling up those cauldrons release back to the central sun the precious little electrons and substance which was so misqualified by humanity. And therefore, not only is the individual cleansed of these conditions, but also the universe. And God is glorified and the new rays issue forth from the sun as the old rays are transmuted and there is a greater glow of God magnificence as the misqualified substance becomes then once again in the polarized pulsations of the central sun. God magnificent energy, God released energy, God qualified energy, God inspired energy going forth into your world and stirring you to the very depths of your imaginations as you realize that what you have called consciousness is only a little river of light which you have used and suddenly there is born in your mind the realization that that river of light can be expanded to become the ocean and then that ocean to become the cosmos. And you see that nothing shall be impossible unto you anymore as the words were spoken of old concerning the tree of life saying, let us put man forth from the garden now lest he eat of the tree of life and live forever. For if we leave him here in his present state he will eat of that tree and live forever and then nothing will be impossible unto him. Let me say unto you then that the great powers of limitations that were inspired by the karmic board to set the bounds of man's habitations are the functions of cosmic law. And also let it be known that the power of limitless light that will bring you your freedom is also the power of cosmic law. And therefore cosmic energy, cosmic purpose, and cosmic grace will come to every man who pursues, not necessarily with a hasty pace, but with a firm tread, the path that leads to his goal, to his victory, to his freedom, and to his service to the hierarchy. And there is no more important service that you can render, precious ones, than that which you render to the cosmic hierarchy of light. I say this with the fullness of my love, as I bestow upon you in leaving a radiance of my transmutative love for the cosmos. I say, in God's name, by his grace, to us all, it is done.
center of Fohat is a furnace, white hot, transmutative, destroying the aspects of human laziness. We come then, born on wings of the wind, to produce in the responsive ones a passion for the divine will. The divine will. The divine will. Tenderly, the eternal promise is born. Wholeness. Comprehensiveness. The grasp of Christ reality. The dust of moldering tombs surrounds the faithless one. They play with crude stones and as monstrous children filled with inharmony, they proceed to play these languid games. But we are concerned with the marvels of the spiritual world. We are concerned with the passions for faith, with the understanding of existence, of bliss, of harmony, of the labors of love, of the realities of God, of the fashion of those things to come, the former things that have passed away, by reason of their faithless manifestations, have had withdrawn from them the energy supports of higher octaves of light, and they have crumbled. We are concerned not with crumbling manifestations or architecture, we are concerned with the fires of the spirit and with the circuits from far off worlds. We are concerned with the magnificent love ray that penetrates the dark of the night and cuts it. We are concerned with the love ray that can be felt, but we are also concerned with that which cannot be felt, for its vibratory action is so high that no consciousness is able to discern it. Moria speaks. God has already spoken. And all that we utter is but a rephrasing of the soundings of infinite love. Darkness shudders, for it knows that it has not long to exist, for the light will penetrate it, the light will wash it, the light will produce the miracle of wholeness in it, and the gray ones shall slink away unnoticed, even by their own contemporaries. Strange banalities cause men to linger by the pond. They will not wash in it. They will stand and examine the lave with their eyes. They will say our garments are not yet dusty enough. They will contemplate the hopeless ones and ignore the manifestations of the victorious ones. They will hear the thunder from afar and say, Who is bowling? They love the tales of Rip Van Winkle. They wish to sleep. They wish to immerse themselves in a state of nihilism, oblivion, fear of involvement. Gingerly they step from place to place. And the signs of the times pass unnoticed. These are without much soul substance, and their desires are earth-earthy. 
We are concerned with men and women of valor who will comprehend the meaning of this hour. It is the twelfth hour. Now the night is far spent. The circuit of the day is at hand, for the dawn begins from midnight. And those who understand the mysteries will see that the last can become first, and the dawn can come before midnight, or midnight before the dawn. It is up to the consciousness, for the consciousness transcends the hours. And so, as we speak to you today, it is in order to tell you that the approach of the dark clouds of misery for humanity are at hand. But as St. Germain has told you, the brothers of light hopefully outpicture and portray in their diagrams now an era of new hope because some have accepted our words. If no one had accepted our words, if all things should have continued as from the first, if the spirit of man should have become broken and his frustrations utter, I tell you then that these conditions could and would have speedily manifested. Some have asked what of January 18, 1969. The date is accurate. The fashions of the times themselves reveal the coming shadows. But they have not spoken of the coming light, which is greater than the coming shadows. And therefore, I am authorizing those members that are associated with the Temple of Goodwill in Darjeeling to draw a cup of light for their personal person and then asking them to take one for a friend. Let that cup of light be charged with goodwill. And whenever your tongues or minds are prone to reach into the dark, dank caves of subterranean subterfuge and draw out a vapid sense, I say to you, do not do it and betray the soul. Rather, reach up unto God and draw from the bosom of Abraham the ungans of cosmic grace. Draw cosmic grace. Draw cosmic grace. And let grace act in your world, not those miserable defenses of the human ego that have again and again sought to protect a fading image. We are concerned with the soul, and the soul is itself qualified with transcendence over the flesh form. The soul has endured many bodies, and many bodies have endured the soul. Quite frankly, they seem to accommodate one another quite well, considering some of the circumstances which individuals have passed through. But I should think, as the years have flown, that men and women should also consider that they are somewhat bored with the constant repetition of unhappiness. Yet, here is the strangest thing which Moria must comment on. Individuals seem to be almost masochistic, for they continue even when they know what is wrong to do it, and they continue to produce the fruit of strivings toward misery. What is wrong then? What is the syndrome in mortal consciousness that we must cure? You ask us to come as the good physician and we come. You say to us, will you help us? I have said that I would, and when I come to do so, I sometimes find the door is closed and locked, for the invocation was more spoken by the lips than the heart, and individuals invoke that which they do not understand, and they call forth their victory and the light when they cannot stand the light upon their person. The light that descends is going to show up the defects in your world. It could not be otherwise. When you call for light, you can expect a revelation. And the revelation may be a bit of horror, or individuals throw up their hands in horror and they say, oh, this is awful. And they seem to think that the ascended masters have revealed these conditions of their own world, or created them, which is more to the point. The ascended masters have not created them nor revealed them. The ascended masters have invoked the light, and the light has revealed it. But the light also possesses the power to cleanse and to purify 
But men and women are not interested in purification. They are interested instead in hiding their faces as ostriches into the sand. They do not want to look upon the records of their own life. Let these poor souls now understand that by looking upon them momentarily, they can then swiftly turn away from them to the light and say, Oh God, save me. I am salvation. They can say this of themselves, for the power to save is actually inherent within man. The power to save lives. The power to save beats the heart. The power to complete the work of the building of the temple is in the architecture itself. And man is also an archetype as well as a manifestation. And some do not understand this, how man can be both. But is he not dual? Is he not both body and soul? And yet the body is only the part that is of least value. It is merely a means to function in the physical octaves of life so that the soul can be nourished. But what do men do? They fatten the body and starve the soul. And this is the most practical statement that I have made and one that ought to be pondered and considered. For if individuals in the world today would spend half as much time pampering that blessed soul which they are as they do that body which they are not, I think you would see the most glorious revival of spirituality upon this planet that has ever occurred in any golden age past. And now is the time. The students of the light will understand what I have said and they will understand why I have said it, which is more to the point. For I have spoken in order to firm the shores of your soul. I have spoken in order to encourage you to wholeness of being, to purification of mind. Learn not to impute wrong motives to others, and you shall learn how not to have them yourself. I do not say that they do not have them, but certainly, blessed ones, by continually picking up the fabric of evil and examining it, to see what it is made of will not in any way provide for you the washing and cleansing for which you call. You can only do that by handling the garments of perfection, by taking the blessed garments of the living Christ in your hands and saying as you gently caress them, these I too can wear. How could it be otherwise? In the name of Almighty God, what do we have in the world today? A group of children playing games with the universe, playing games with atomic energy, playing games with electronic energy, playing games with cosmic law. You have a saying upon earth that some play the game called Russian roulette. Well, I tell you, mankind today are engaged in a still more dangerous game, and they are not escaping with impunity. And so, as the solemn hour approaches, and as you prepare to enter the new year, you should understand that heaven is not without preparation. We are prepared and we are preparing. We have never stopped. We never will. Though the planet were reduced to a pinch of dust, we would begin again. We cannot, because God cannot, refuse to love the creation, even when understanding fails to exist in consciousness, and misunderstanding is rampant as a raging lion, we must ourselves portray the grace of God that has always sustained right actions upon the planetary body, and we must express ourselves today and say to you that there are millions who cry out for light. And I would like to go a little further than that and say that there are billions who cry out for light, for from what position in consciousness do they cry? Some cry outwardly, and theirs is like the mewing of a kitten. Others cry from the depth, and others cry in the realms of the subconscious, but almost all are crying out for the creative word to be manifest in the soul. The problem is that when the answer comes, they are conditioned by habit responses and they are also subject to the contagions of the world's thought 
and therefore they go astray and linger over their cups of delusion without understanding the meaning of grace. Grace will help to fulfill the law. Grace will wash the soul and cleanse it. Grace will put fiber in your bones. Grace will make you to stand up for God and be counted. Thank you. Won't you please be seated? I am not concerned with just the physical rising. I am concerned with the rising of the soul. For the soul, as it becomes flooded with light and imbued with the will of God, will understand the slashing of the word. We must cut you free from human vicissitude. So many times, so very, very many times, your hearts are stirred. And in that great stirring and passion of emotional substance, you say we would do anything. When the moment comes to hold up the shield, then you say, where is the nearest game? Let us play cards. We say to you that the business in which you are engaged is not a play game. It is a serious business and one that requires the full concentration of mind and heart and being. We do not say that the souls of the faithful need always become flexed as a steel rod or a sword. They can be encased in scabbard. They can be retained and rest. And it is permissible to have suitable exercise for the body as well as the mind. But men must understand that their judgments have been impaired and that the life records of humanity do not show that they have exercise balance. They have said, everything for myself and nothing for God. But they have not known it, which is more to the point, which is worse. They have actually said to themselves, because we do this little thing for God, he will surely overlook our faults. Well, precious ones, do you understand what I mean when I say that you will judge yourself If God were judging you, I think that his mercy, which endureth forever, would perhaps forever overlook your foibles and ridiculous attitudes. And therefore, you might go on forever without ever apprehending him. But God has put himself within you. And that self within you that identifies with you, that you identify with, will judge you. And this is harder than the Father himself in the creative essence. For it is aware of the self-deceits and subtleties you have practiced. And it is not inclined toward the mercy that the Eternal Father himself would express because it is identified with the self and has some instinct for self-preservation and because it recognizes that the realities of life are what you seek. It chastens you with a higher aspect of the law. And this is a part of the divine plan. So oh, then, self-judgers, I say to you, accept now the judgments of heaven, accept now the guidance of the ascended masters who also have accepted the judgments of self, for we are products of it. It was the programming of divine grace within ourselves that made us feel the inflexibility of the law. And men say, must I do this and must I do that? Well, of course you must not if you do not want to. But what is the end result? It is pain and suffering and the accumulation of error and darkness. And this you do not want. So what else can we do? How can the good physician heal except he say, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee? If the sins are forgiven, must they be repeated? And if they are repeated, will it not be with the self-same result? For law is God and God is law. Men must understand the difference of the aspects. They must understand that there are times when we come with inspiration, there are times when we come with prayer. We come with wings, we come with song, but there are other times we come with a good paddle in hand. And I say that it is, and if I were you, I would kiss it first before you kiss the Blarney Stone. For the paddle, the chastenments of heaven, is a valuable precept to guide the soul in moments when it seeks self-deceit. For well, self-deceit is most subtle. And it was the original 
manifestation of serpentine force working through the mind and the intelligence of Eve that created the abortion of the world mission. And every avatar since that hour that has come forth, serving and ministering throughout the ages, has understood as it was recorded in the chant of the Yasna, as it was recorded in the priesthood of Melchizedek, as it was recorded in the archives of the great white brotherhood, as it was recorded in the thunder from Zion. I am come then this day to drench you with the will of God, to let it course through your veins in magnificent magnitude. What is it? It is a rising hope. It is a fire from the sun. What is it? It is the fire from the sun raised to regeneration. What is it? It is the wings of the dawn, the wings of Serapis. It is the high flight of the soul. It is the goal fittedness of immortality. It is the reality of the face of God. And in its whiteness and purity, it causes all lesser images to fade away, to pale away, to be no more. And by and by, men see in this high white face the supremacy of the ageless Father, the magnificence of the self revealed, the inscrutable mystery of the Sphinx, of the pyramid of light, of the summit building. And men understand with gratitude why the Lord God of hosts is able to gather his people and to garnish them with the fragrance of myrrh and of frankincense and bestow upon them the substance of pure gold. The Christ manifest in the creche of the heart comes forth. He is born anew each day. And like a little smiling face, son, he speaks to everyone and saith, I am come to do God's will, not my own. But when individuals understand the subtlety of this, they laugh. For now they say, what is the secret of it all? The secret of it all is to make my will God's will. And then I no longer have this duality, this conflict of identities, my will and thy will. But there is only thy will. Here is the secret of it all. Here is the understanding that enables me to stand fast right where I am or to move upon a camel's back across the barren sands. It's the understanding of thy will be done. I wish at this moment to express the gratitude of my heart to those souls who responded to my appeal in connection with my desire to endow Sanctus Germanus with a mother house for the Keepers of the Flame fraternity. I did not wish to apply too much salve to you before I came to tell you of my gratitude because sometimes individuals are prone to think and I say this to you with humility and not to hurt you, that they can buy their way toward heaven. And therefore, they offer their hearts and their possessions to God. We are not accepting your offerings in that light, but we are accepting them as the right hand of service. You have become soldiers of the light, and in this vein we accept it. We recognize the correct attitudes of many of the chilas, but we also wish to make clear into the realm of objectivity so that all may know the correct attitude in giving that this is a glorious opportunity which you have availed yourselves of. And one day you will stand and behold what has been produced by the miracle of your devotion and that will be a shining reward, an ageless memory, because the souls of men must be kept and taught to keep the flame. For God is a consuming fire, and as he burns upon the high altars of men's hearts, he purges and refines those hearts from the deceit and subtlety of desperate wickedness. And he brings those hearts into the shining estate of the God-Self, where they are an altar, 
And as that flame burns on and on through the ages, it becomes more glorious. It widens its shining sphere. And the soul, aware then of the pillar of fire that is right here, will understand that it is a beacon light burning toward the summit heights of cosmic identity, the realm of the free, the realm of the brave, the realm of men and women of courage, Moria roars. Will you roar with me? It is the will of God, and we lions must lie down also with the lambs, for they shall inherit the earth that we shall help them to create. And we shall go on unto other realms, for men and women of the first ray must understand a little secret now that you may not always retain that estate. For as the cycle turns, as the great cosmic zodiac is revealed, and as the law passes through the various sectors, individuals move from ray first to second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, so that all are able to have the great hierarchical interplay of the cosmic forces of the ancient of days, bathing the soul in its mighty light rays, and all are washed by each one, manifesting then the sweetness of the sun, light descending from afar, comes close to the soul, it does not mar, it heals, and so within the soul it seals the God patterns strong and faithful. And to the faithful we give our charge. And so the first ray men, the lions, they will also one day themselves lie down as lambs. And the beauty of all things will be understood. And men will see that as they themselves wear the garments, Allah, the old statement of the Indians, that a man must walk in another's moccasins so many days before he can understand what experiences that soul has had. This is the meaning then of that which makes men free, which enables them to move through the various cycles of eternity and experience for themselves those rays which some have criticized and said, I would not for a world be caught dead in that ray. Well, blessed ones, you're all going to have to do it, so you better pray because sooner or later the blessed little lambs that are among you may find yourselves lions of the first ray, and some of the lions of the first ray lie down as lambs. And then you see, having had all of these experiences, you will all understand one another and some of the problems involved in the various ray manifestations. And this is actually a great experience criteria where the soul is having these experiences and learning to become a God in manifestation. For when you have satisfactorily passed through a given ray classification and you are taken then into another realm, what happens? Well, blessed ones, you have to master that one too. And when you have gone all through them, then you see you have attained your hierarchical victory and hierarchical bliss. But what happens after that? Well, I tell you, some of you might feel like you ought to give me a kiss when I tell you. You will then ultimately be assigned to one or more of the rays and there you will stay. And after having had all of these experiences in all of the rays, you will know exactly what you are getting into. And that is what has happened with me. And I am classified as Father Moria, the stern, severe one. I am classified as a roaring lion when that particular title was given to Satan himself. And of course you know that I am not in league with him because I am in league with the will of God. And it comes as a whirlwind within my being and I desire to communicate it to you and I desire to inspire you with the passions of the freedom flame through the will of God. For your beloved Saint Germain has again and again said, that without the men and women of the first ray, there would be no need to have the men and women of the seventh. And I want to say to him that without the men and women of the seventh ray, we ourselves would have no end. 
And so now again, as we lift our consciousness toward the sacred fire, toward the shining goalposts that inspire, and as we seek to carry the ball through to victory, we want you to understand that this love which we feel, this love that heals mankind, is stronger now than it has ever been in the world. And this activity is stronger now regardless of all of its trials and tribulations. But I want you to recognize the need to constantly uphold and support our messengers and the heart center and to understand that the beauty that must be drawn forth in the new focus of light at Santa Barbara will involve the participation of all of the students of the light. For we must change the face of youth. We must give them renewed hope. We must not accept the discord and chaos they have now in this time invoked. We must replace it with a higher vision, with an understanding that the divine mind of God has conceived of such infinite grace and spun these dreams and visions in an environment so wondrous and beautiful that the mind itself would faint if it were to behold it. Let me say then that gradually, gradually the strength of thy right arm shall be builded up. Gradually the strength of thy heart shall be builded up and gradually thou shalt find that thou canst walk through the portals of initiation. Man, know thyself and there you can for the first time behold your own face. Mirrored in the spiritual akasha, the face of God that shines back at you, the face of good that comes to view. This is thyself, thy own self, thy native habitat. This is thy land, thy consummation in the flame of love. Thou shalt stand and all around thee shining faces, souls that are now washed will offer to thee the understanding of the price that this has cost them to make the sacrifice, the blessed step toward God that lifts them up with shining eyes beneath his holy rod. Oh, Len, Parusha. <laughs>